This conference will now be recorded. There you go. Welcome everybody to the Vegetable and Berry Grower webinar featuring an update on insects and diseases. And Margaret Skinner will take the first half of this show talking about insects, followed by Ann Hazelrig and diseases, and then there'll be time for a discussion. We'll go through both of the presentations um, without taking questions, but please type them into the chat if they come up for you. And we can read those off after. And then, of course, you can just ask questions verbally when they're done. So with that, take it away, Margaret. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, Becky, you want to go to the next one? Okay. So I titled this, What's Eating You? Really Knowing the Good from the Bad and Everything in Between. And let's go to the next one. I wish I, I almost wish that I could click it. So I just want to say the most important thing if you're trying to manage your insect pests is to know what it is and what does it do and when does it do it. And these are really obvious things and everybody thinks, of course, no problem. Of course I know what it is. And sometimes it's more complicated than meets the eye. And these days, when people are trying to use more and more biological control or reduce their pesticide use, uh, knowing the good from the bad is really important. Um, okay, so I wanted to give you an example uh, why it's particularly important. And um, <clears throat> with aphids, they tend to all look kind of the same, but they are actually very different. and. Uh, potato aphid and foxglove aphid are common pests in high tunnel vegetables, as are green peach aphid. And oftentimes, people decide that they want to release natural enemies. And they often assume that what they have are green peach aphid because they're kind of greenish, or maybe sometimes they're a little pink, and oh, yeah, that's what this says in the directions. But in fact, um, the two most common parasitoids that you can buy are Aphidius irvi and Aphidius colmani. And Aphidius colmani does not work against potato aphid or foxglove aphid. Um, those aphids are, the bodies are too big and they just kick the parasite out of the way. So you really need to use Aphidius irvi. So when you're saying to yourself, well, oh, I don't know, I don't know what I got. Um, that's when you need to say, send a sample either to Ann at the diagnostic lab or to me. I, generally speaking, I cannot identify it based on a picture. A lot of other insects I can, but with, with aphids, it's a little bit more difficult. So it's really ideal to send the sample. Uh, and I'll give you an example in a minute. And one thing that I learned about just fairly recently um, is there are these things called bacterial symbionts. They live inside the aphid and they're happy inside the aphid, but what they do is they confer resistance to the parasitoid. So sometimes when your parasites are not working as well as you would expect them to, it may be because your aphid population has bacterial symbionts. If in the future, you seem to experience that. You need to send me some samples. And I have a collaboration with a scientist down in Georgia who is able to test aphids for the symbiont. OK, so next uh, next slide. So this is a picture that I got um, from a grower that said, oh my god, what should I do? And I said, you need to send a sample because there was no way for me to know what uh, particular species it was. He didn't know what it was. And so um, when you look at that picture, it looks like there's lots of little baby aphids and lots of big aphids and some winged ones, which would suggest that the pest population is very high and it's getting ready to disperse uh, more widely in his crop. So he sent some samples to me a week or so later, and you can go to the next slide, and this is what I found. I found on his leaves a bunch of little midge larvae that were feeding on the aphids. That's the little orange thing, the Aphidolides larvae. 
There were several uh, lady beetles, several different stages of lady beetles. There were syrphid fly larvae, those little kind of maggoty things. And then there were lots of mummies. And so what I said to this grower was, you need to decide for yourself how widespread this pest problem is. And if you have all these natural enemies, if you spray something, even if it's a biologic, you know, something that's um, organic, that will kill all of these natural enemies. <clears throat> And so what he ended up doing was he ordered a few parasitoids and some aphidolides because it was later in the season and the aphidolides tend to cycle through their population more quickly. And he just emailed me the other day and he said, oh, all the aphids are gone. I can't see them anymore. So that's a success story that only occurred because he thought it through and he knew what the natural enemies looked like, or he ultimately, sorry, just a minute. He knew what they looked like after we talked about it. Okay, so that's why it's really important to evaluate both the pest population and the natural enemy. Okay, now I just wanted to show this picture of um, tomato hornworm. And this is another thing I didn't really know before. You know, we've all seen the the larvae with those white mummies on them. What I did not realize was that I knew that those were the the pupil stage. What I didn't know is the the parasite lays its eggs inside the caterpillar. The larvae feed on the inside and then they come out. And that picture down below shows all the larvae emerging from the inside of that poor caterpillar. Then they will make, then they will spin their cocoon and make the mummy. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing was these parasites don't just attack uh, tomato hornworm. They also attack fall armyworm, which is coming along in cabbage looper, which is a good thing. And then there's always BT if all else fails. Okay, next. <clears throat> So I also wanted to point out to you, one of the things that we've seen a fair amount of recently is um, the eggs of parasitic flies. So when you're looking at your pests, um, if you see those little white dots on them, you know that those are the eggs of the parasites. Um, those eggs will hatch, the larva will burrow into the insect and then continue to feed and then emerge later. So if you find those, you may want to let those that pest survive because it's going to help uh, increase that parasitic fly population. Okay, next. So I want to talk a little bit about stink bugs because I get a lot of calls from people saying, oh, I've got the brown marmalade stink bug in my, in my garden. <clears throat> And probably all of you have heard of the brown marmorated sink bug, which does occur here. I do see it in my house from time to time. And that's the one on the far left hand side. <clears throat> and but there's lots of other <clears throat> stink bugs that look very similar. Some of them are pests and some of them aren't. So all the insects on, in the top row are stink bug pests that you might find. And so you see the brown stink bug there. Boy, does that look like a brown marmorated stink bug. But the key is that it doesn't have <clears throat> doesn't have the two white bands on the antennae. So that's how you know that it's uh, the brown stink bug instead. So then there's the spine soldier bug. <clears throat> that looks very much like the brown marmorated stink bug also. But in fact, that's a predator that's very effective. There's a whole bunch of different species of spine soldier bugs um, and the key to those is you can see um, oh, I can't point it out but you can see the little points on the uh, thorax that I wish I could I, can, I can't do that I can't point that out can I Becky I guess no. not anyway so but it's always a good idea to to really look at the insects that you're finding in your garden to make sure that it is what it is and when in doubt, send it along. Okay, next. Okay, so squash bugs. 
uh, this is another one that is often, there are often uh, sort of mistakes in terms of what uh, people are seeing. The one on the far left is the standard squash bug that we usually see. But this year I also saw on a cucumber crop, this other one called Repetita, which is again doing basically the same thing as uh, our standard uh, squash bug, but is a little bit different. Then there's the Western conifer seed bug that does not feed on our uh, pests, um, on our crops. The way you can tell that from the squash bug is the seed bugs have those, um, oh, on their hind leg, they have sort of a wide, widened area. Okay, next. So I'm just going to quickly go through squash bugs because it seems to be an ongoing issue. And Vern would say, oh, just cover them with row covers with everything else. And sometimes that might work, but you got to let the, the pollinators in. And so that's where it gets a little bit complicated for it to work. Um, so this shows the damage. Uh, and let's go on to the next one. So the thing that's so amazing about this particular insect that makes it such a challenge is they can, the female can lay lots of eggs and the adults will live 75 to 130 days. That is a long time for them to feed, be feeding on your crop. So even though there's only one generation a year, they can be around all year long because they live for so darn long. Okay, next. Um, so lots of times people say, well, what should I do about it? And the damage threshold is one egg mass per plant. Oh, my God. Uh, good luck with that. <clears throat> um, so really the key is to remove all the debris from after and during the growing season to reduce their inclination to be there. I have read that sometimes you can use trap plants like... Oh, Hubbard squash. They really like Hubbard squash. So theoretically, you could plant those along the edges with some success. Some people uh, put down boards so they can, um, because they'll hide underneath the boards, and then you can hand pick them that way because it's pretty hard to hand pick them uh, if they're on your plant because they just fall down. Okay, next. So then I wanted to just talk a little bit about tarnished plant bug and four-line plant bug, which you're likely to see the damage of these days. Um, Vern wanted me to talk about these guys. I, I hate talking about them because it's really difficult to manage them. And part of the reason is they're all over the place. So um, the, the best strategy is to reduce your weeds early because they love weeds even better than a lot of the vegetables. So once they get into your crop, feeding on the weeds, then they'll just move over to your crop. Even if you put, even if you dig up the weeds later, it may be too late because they're already there. <clears throat> so uh, that, that's about it. I want, I, um, no, uh, oh, I know there's the one other thing about tarnished plant bug. Um, uh, a parasitoid from Europe was released, oh, several, maybe 10 years ago in New Hampshire and apparently was having some good impact on reducing the, the pest population, but I really haven't heard a lot about it here. I haven't seen any evidence of it here, but if you see that parasitoid, then let me know. Okay. So uh, the, the last couple of things that I just these are worksheets that I developed a long time ago. I know nobody has time to do anything anymore, but ideally coming filling out these forms at least once in your life um, when you have a pest problem, it's something that you can refer back to multiple years so that you don't have to rethink it every time you see your tarnished plant bug again. And there's one other one. Uh, this top one sort of talks about the biology and those kinds of things so that you have sort of a plan so that when you see it, you're all ready to go. And this second one is, you know, if you are able to, it's great 
to actually keep track of what you do and what worked and what didn't work. And I think that might be it. Okay. Not bad. Take yeah. it away again. All right, cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to talk about some things, some disease things that I've been seeing lately. Uh, you guys are great about sending pictures. That's always the best way to start, I think, to send a picture because uh, I may recognize it or I might send it around and other people recognize it. So that's a good place to start. Okay, next slide or first slide. So we all got a boatload of rain last night and I suspect tomatoes are gonna be showing up with this kind of damage. This is just cracking and it happens when you get rapid water uptake. So we might all be seeing some of that in the next few days in the tomatoes that are ripening. Okay. Uh, also, I think there have been a pretty high amount of ripening disorders this year, just because of the high temps, you know, anything over uh, 85, 90, you get all sorts of weird things happening to tomato fruit. And there's yellow shoulder, blotchy ripening, white internal tissue, gray wall, but all of them are associated with um, potassium uh, getting to the fruit and high temperatures. So, um, oops, let's go back one. I forget what else I was going to Oh, and one, another thing you might notice is that uh, in tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, uh, we uh, see blossom drop when temps are over 90 degrees. So if you have a lull in the action on fruit, it may be because of this hot period where blossoms were dropping and that's pretty normal, unfortunately. Okay, next one. Uh, the other thing that happens with high temperatures, uh, you might have poor pollination. I've gotten a few pictures of these, of uh, cucumbers, zucchinis, um, temperatures over 90 degrees with high humidity, your, the pollen becomes sticky, the bees may not work. Um, I guess in hot temperatures, you get more male blossoms than female produced. So that may be another thing that's going on with your um, lack of fruit or a, a lull in the action on the fruit. And also hot temperatures can cause bitter uh, cucumbers. So just be aware that there's some of these things that are just gonna be chalked up to, you know, this hot, hot weather that we've had. I feel like I need to move to Nova Scotia. I need to move farther north. It's too hot for me. Um, the other thing that we're seeing uh, is, I've gotten some pictures of this, is gold flecking. And this is another um, kind of ripening disorder. The first thing you want to do when you see this is uh, rule out th mites and thrips. So we'll have Margaret take a look at it first, because the, both of those pests can cause damage similar to this. Um, also, stink bugs can cause some of this uh, kind of damage. It wouldn't be as evenly spaced as it is with gold flecking. But again, this is all due to high daytime temperatures, warm nighttime temperatures combined with high humidity. Um, and some cultivars are more prone than others to this gold flecking. And I guess it weakens the, uh, you know, the skin a bit, so it's, it's not a great thing. And customers are probably reluctant to buy it if it's if there's a lot of gold flecking. Blossom end rot. Uh, this is another one that's uh, localized calcium deficiency, basically due to moisture fluctuation. Um, usually, just the first uh, fruits produced show this, and then uh, then um, the next flush is okay. We've seen some different symptoms. Those uh, Pictures on the left were uh, sent in by a grower and they didn't totally look like traditional blossom end rot, but I put them in a moist chamber and nothing fruited out. So I think that's, I think blossom end rot can uh, show up in all sorts of different ways. But um, yeah, usually once water gets uh, evened out, you don't see too much of it anymore. And some cultivars might be more susceptible to it uh, than others. And it's just a, a rot. The calcium can't get out to the ends of the, of the fruit. Okay, next. Okay, so blossom end rot on peppers. For years, I thought that was sun scald when you'd see it on the sides of peppers, but I guess that's how uh, blossom end rot occurs on peppers. 
So um, that's something that we might be uh, seeing more of on, on peppers. So just be aware of that, that it's again, this moisture fluctuation and calcium not getting out to the ends of the fruit. Okay, anthracnose. This is a disease of um, tomatoes kind of on ripe and overripe fruit. And the reason this might be a, a problem is that it's really, it rapidly grows above 80 degrees. So we've had a lot of hot temperatures and if your tomatoes are sitting there, they've been picked, this kind of thing might show up. And it's just sort of a depressed circle uh, in the fruit and then it gets a black center and then that sporulates. So um, just something to watch for, maybe picking, you know, airing on picking a little uh, earlier than uh, picking when they might be too ripe. The good thing about this is that it, you don't really see any problems on the foliage from that disease. Okay, sorry about that, Becky. <laughs> having to go back and forth. Uh, I still get pictures about this one. Most growers, a lot of growers know what this is, but it's very common this type of time of year in high tunnels. It's tomato leaf mold. And it, what you do, you see these bright yellow spots on the upper side of the leaf. And then if you turn it upside down, you'll see that brown, purpley, velvety spore. And um, this is another one that just really likes high humidity. There is some resistance. Some cultivars are more resistant than others. Um, so that's something you can make note of in the future. But it's all about keeping that humidity down below 85%, which is tough when it's, you know, so humid outside. Um, but it means just rolling up sides and getting fans and, and opening up vents, opening up uh, ends of high tunnels. Um, the good thing about this disease that it it doesn't attack the fruit, but it can, you know, it affects the photosynthetic surface. But um, most growers just tend to ignore it. And I think if you, you know, there are fungicides you could spray, but unless that humidity gets down below 85%, I think you're just wasting your time and your money. So a lot of people prune uh, the lower leaves up to that first fruit cluster just to provide more air circulation, try not to crowd plants. But that's really common uh, right now in probably every high tunnel I go into. We've gotten a few uh, pictures of powdery mildew. We don't, we don't have nearly as much problem with this disease as we did a few years ago because it came in on a lot of transplants and we sort of were battling it right from May on and that's just fighting a losing battle. But I know so, some growers are seeing it now and it's a fungus disease that causes that white powdery um, spot on the upper side of the foliage. Um, Again, it likes high humidity. It's very host specific. So if you see powdery mildew on your cucurbits, that uh, is not the same powdery mildew that's gonna attack tomatoes. So they're, they're very host specific. The one that attacks tomato is pretty much gonna stay on, on tomato. Um, the good news about this disease is that it doesn't overwinter here in Vermont, unless you are holding over tomato plants with the uh, disease all winter long in a greenhouse or something. So it totally dies out and then uh, comes in later on the season. Um, you know, it's got a really lightweight spore and can blow all around. Uh, I guess the best um, management for this, we've got some really good organic options, which is great. Uh, JMS Stylet Oil and Microthiol Disperse, which is a sulfur. Um, alternated is uh, seems to be work for a lot of growers. But again, anything you can do to keep that humidity down in a greenhouse will help. And that's uh, maybe that's where Chris Callahan can come in and, and tell us all how to <laughs> lower humidity when it's 90% uh, humidity outside. But that's a that's another day and another talk. Okay, I forget what else. Okay, magnesium deficiency. I still get pictures of this. Uh, this is um, really common in high tunnel tomatoes right now. It causes that uh, 
intervenal chlorosis, and then it actually can cause browning, intervenal browning, and it looks bad, and it looks like it's uh, infectious because it's moving up the plant, but um, it's typically of no concern, and you know, people prune off those lower leaves just so they don't have to look at them, <laughs> and it gets rid of, you know, some of those uh, leaves, but it rarely affects uh, the plant that much, but I know Vern has some good information on um, spraying some uh, Epsom salts. So he's got a fact sheet on that. You could probably just Google it or, or um, we can a attach a link or something. But for the most part, I think growers just sort of ignore it. But on this one, you know, if you turn the leaf upside down, you won't see any of that sporulation, that powdery stuff. Uh, septoria, okay, I'm sorry, Becky. Um, Septoria alternaria leaf spot, that's showing up. We finally started getting some rain. So this is the one that we're gonna have to some extent every year outside. Uh, and maybe uh, I've seen it in high tunnels too on the, um, on the edges of the tunnel where uh, rain can blow, splash in and, uh, and spores can blow in on the, on the sides, uh, the rows on the nearest the open uh, sides. But it, fung, two different fungus diseases, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of academic which one is which, but Septoria has that little uh, brown spot with a gray center, Alternaria sort of has a bigger leaf spot with uh, um, the one picture on the right is the Alternaria. It has a bigger leaf spot often with that advancing yellow margin and a bullseye appearance to the leaf spot. But um, like I said, it's academic. Uh, and every rain, rain we get, once the it overwinters on dead tomato tissue, splashes up in pretty much in July is when we start seeing it. Um, and then every rain event, when we get enough rainfall and wet leaves, uh, it'll move its way up the plant. So if it's a dry year, it won't really move all the way up in the plant. In some wet years, I've seen it totally defoliate uh, field tomatoes. Um, but uh, this grower that sent these pictures was doing a good job. It, the tomatoes are staked, there's plastic. Um, and probably if you do have field tomatoes and this is showing up, uh, I remember Vern saying, I thought it was good advice. You know, at this point, you know, maybe two or three well-timed fungicide sprays will buy you enough protection to get you to the end of the season. Um, so if, if you're organic, it would be one of the coppers um, are probably the best for that. Uh, and you might have to spray every five to seven days, but you know, maybe if you do it for a few weeks, uh, you can buy yourself enough time uh, to make it to the end of the season. All right, next slide. Uh, celery anthracnose. I got a picture from a grower. Uh, this is kind of a relatively new disease in celery and it causes curling and twisting of the foliage and it almost when i first saw it i thought uh the farmer had used 2,4-D because it looks just like herbicide damage like yeah really curled and twisted foliage you get scarring on the petioles and then you can also get a heart rot like we're um like like a calcium issue but this is all celery anthracnose it's a fungus disease. It likes warm, wet conditions. So uh, you might be seeing some of this. It's um, seed borne. So that's something that, uh, you know, we might be able to use seed treatment for. Uh, fungicides don't seem to really have much effect on it, but not, not a whole lot is known about that disease. We're still learning stuff. Next one. Gummy stem blight. This is a fungus disease that has a few different phases, and I've gotten probably three samples of this disease. It attacks all cucurbits, uh, but to varying degrees, and it causes like leaf edge dieback. Sometimes it'll cause a leaf spot, um, and then it also will attack the stem uh, down at the soil line, and it attacks the cortical tissue. So you, if you look at that stem, it looks like it's, you know, kind of rotted away. And a lot of times there's an orange exudate. Uh, that's the gummy 
part of it, the gummy stem blight part of it, and lots of fruiting bodies. Uh, so if you're seeing wilting in the field in cucurbits, uh, always check the base of the plant because uh, squash vine borer could be in there too. Um, but this gummy stem blight, I have seen a fair amount of it this year. It overwinters on seed and on crop debris. Uh, so rotation, um, and let's look at the next slide. The other phase of this disease is it can cause a fruit rot phase. And so um, the, that's the, the disease, uh, those little circular holes is what it looks like on pumpkin. A lot of times on butternut squash, it's really easy to see and it causes these swirling patterns uh, on the fruit. And a reason to keep up with uh, cucumber beetle control or powdery mildew control is that um, if you've got a lot of powdery mildew or wounding, um, you can have more of this fruit rot phase from the gummy stem blight disease. Okay, the, I think this is, might be the last disease I have. Um, downy mildew of cucurbits. This is one that doesn't overwinter in Vermont, kind of like late blight. It blows in on storm fronts and it can attack all cucurbits to some degree. There is resistance in a lot of the cucumbers and maybe other um, squash and things like that. But what you see are these yellow spots, sort of angular spots on the upper side of the leaf. Uh, and it's always delimited stopped by the leaf vein. And if you look at the underside of the leaf, you'll see that um, browning contained within the leaf veins. And uh, in the early morning when humidity is high, you will see the sporulation, that white sporulation uh, of the fungus disease. It doesn't affect the fruit, but boy, it can wipe out a field in no time at all. And I sent out a little message about that because uh, they had recently found the disease in Massachusetts, right on the Vermont border. And I just checked, there's a website you can look at if you just Google downy mildew I-pipe, I-P-I-P-E, and it'll show you where the disease has been found. And I, it's, there's another little spot of it in Quebec. So we're kind of surrounded and it'll be interesting to see what this next storm does because stuff just blew up the coast. So uh, we might be seeing this. Um, to avoid the problem, you've got to have protectant fungicides on. So um, I would recommend uh, getting those on just because of the some of the wetter, weather patterns and watching for this. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, no, one more slide. Um, uh, basically, the plant diagnostic clinic is open for commercial growers, so uh, we're happy to try to help you out. Email me first and send pictures, and then um, I mail has been kind of funky to Jeffords, so I'm recommending that people either drop it off at my house or mail it to my house. So that's why I'd like an email first, and then uh, we can come up with how best to to get it to me. But um, happy to help. And um, that's basically all I have to say <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so Great. thanks. Thank you so much, Anne and Margaret. That was excellent. Uh, this is Byrne. I did just want to emphasize the importance of sending samples and reports to both of you because there are a number of National websites, you mentioned that Herbert Downy Mildew, there's one on late blight. People are tracking invasive insects, the movement north or south. So the confirmations from experts like yourselves are really important to be able to do that kind of tracking, as well as, of course, it's really informative to the grower. Yeah. So I don't see any questions in the chat, but just open it up if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions of Ann or Margaret. Now would be the time. I'll just say that uh, I've gotten a lot of calls from growers, and I know Margaret has too. You know, all these hot uh, 
all this hot weather, I think some insect populations have exploded like spider mites and thrips um, and broad mites. We've seen some broad mite injury this summer. So just be aware that um, some of these populations in these warm temps are really gonna explode. There were a couple of pests that didn't get mentioned that are probably worth noting. Um, following on diseases, and I know, no, there are two commercial growers, Southwest Vermont and over the border in New York, that have had significant collapses of their cabbage fields, apparently due to Rhizoctonia. So you yeah, might that's right. That I forgot like. to. Yeah, I forgot to put that one in. Yeah, I saw a lot of uh, it's wire stem, and it's. Uh, you see a real constriction at the base and then a collapse. And I think, um, you know, Rhizoctonia is in all soils, but I think when it's warm and wet and the crop is, uh, you know, it attacks mature crops. So yeah, I've seen that a few different places. And there's not much to be done about it because it's, you know, it's in all soils, but rotation uh, can probably, you know, will help. And of course, we have uh, leek moth and sweet midge moving across the state. We have Scott Lewins on the line. I think Scott, is leek moth in every county confirmed at this point? As far as we know, every county in Vermont, except for Wyndham and Windsor County, um, has had at least a report, if not multiple reports over the years of leek moth. Um, it started in the northwestern corner of the state and it's migrating south and east um, and actually seems to be worse at the leading edge. Um, so right now, kind of the center part of the state is, is most hardest hit. And you and Vic Izzo have put together a lot of great information. That's we have. We've shared website. some. Through, yeah, we've shared some through um, the Veg and Berry listserv, and some through the the website, and also conferences. And there's more to come, so stay tuned there. So the second flight is done, right? And so these larvae now that are there are those are the ones you worry about getting down into the bulb. Is that yes. true? Yes. That's absolutely correct, and I'm glad you brought that up because the third flight is actually um, just started, and so it's the, the caterpillars as a result of the second flight that are problematic because they, like you said, make their way down into the bulbs during curing. Um, but the third flight that's happening now, that's typically the overwintering generation, um, and so we don't expect to see eggs being laid. Um, and another larval generation this year. Um, though it's been so warm that I, um, I'm i curious, uh, although I not don't think, um, but curious if there could be a fourth generation for the first time. Has anyone on the call been experiencing leak moth damage this year? And if so, wanna share what you're doing about it? Uh, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Am I on? Yes. Oh, cool. Hi, this is Ryan. Thanks for doing this, everybody. This is really great. I appreciate it. Um, I think I have every single thing of every single slide, so I'm like <laughs> about 100% going here at this farm. Um, I do have some leak moth. I to actually talk to Scott about it, um, and I'm just doing Dipel, spraying Dipel because I don't have any entrust on hand, and I'm just continually spraying that um, just to help with with storage ability of, of some of the onions. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, this is Becky too. I just think it'd be worth Scott um, mentioning some of the findings you guys have about topping onions before storage. I know it's not like 100% uh, confirmed right now, but it seems like a good, for someone like Ryan, maybe a good start. Do you wanna talk about that? Uh, yeah, I can mention briefly. So we have one year's worth of data. Um, so yeah, we're not ready to to say this is this is a definite um, scenario in in uh, every case, but at least in some situations, if you know you have leek moth uh, in your alliums, um, 
we know from Crystal Stewart's work in garlic that you can top the garlic without impacting um, the bulb in storage. And from our preliminary results, you can also top the onions, leaving the, the caterpillars with the leaves in the field and bring the, the bulbs into, into curing and storage without bringing the leek moth caterpillars in, and then they don't wind up in the bulbs. And so we've got some growers who have been doing that in Vermont for the last couple of years um, and and not impacting the, the bulbs after um, curing and storage. Um, certainly if you're growing onions um, to sell fresh, um, then uh, there's no concern at all there with topping the onions as well. And what about the um, releasing the trichogramma? Is that do you you don't have do you have enough data on that yet? Is that really working for leek moth? Yeah. So again, we have one year's worth of data for the for that. Okay. We saw last year um, about a fifty percent reduction um, in the damage as a result of leek moth um, from releasing the, the trichogramma. The the concern with that is that right now the so the species is available for purchase in the U.S. but not in an easily deployable. Um, format for onions. So the company we're working with is out of Quebec and they have these um, nice little protected sachets that you can actually like essentially plant in the beds with the onions on a little popsicle stick. Um, the the trichogramma that you can get, it's a different species. It's not ostrone that people release for um, for European corn borer in, in sweet corn or pepper, that kind of thing. It's a similar uh, species, same genus. It's, it's trichogramma brassicae. Um, and those fly lower. Um, and so if you put those hang tags in your corn of trichogramma um, ostrone or brassicae, the that won't there's nothing to really hang those um hang tags on in uh, in onions or garlic uh and so that's why we went with this company in quebec um so that to my knowledge is not commercially available yet in the u.s um but we're hoping that with some of our data they'll be convinced it's worth their their effort to get it uh imported do those ever establish do the trichogramma establish or do you have to do that every year no matter yeah it's inundative so you have to do it every year they are okay. they are native um but they're they're just not nearly um in populations high enough early enough in the season to do anything can i ask uh, one quick question i gotta scoot i'm, I'm kind of trying to get back in the field um but i was wondering not to change the subject but um so I have some uh, potato, the potatoes this year are just like, uh, they're just uh, dropping. The early varieties are just like brown, yellow, and done. And it's a lot earlier to me for them to just like dying back normally than they, they did last year. And I'm wondering if that's what it is, if it's some fungal issue. Some of the later varieties still look okay, but have some kind of yellow and brown spotting on the leaves. Um, and I'm just curious what that might be. I mean, the early varieties are on the ground done. The plants are dead. Typically, when when growers have sent those in to me, it's been a combination of uh, potato leaf hopper, and yeah. I can always find some early blight alternaria in there, but probably mainly potato leaf hopper. I don't know. What do you think, Margaret? I don't know. I'd have to see what it looked like, but there certainly are a lot of potato leaf hoppers around, I guess. And have you? Ryan, have you gone out and, and looked on the leaf undersides or when you walk through, are there are they just flying up like crazy? Yeah, we have some we have leaf hopper, yeah. So I just yeah, it's, I, it's the first time I've had it, so I'm not I don't have a ton of experience with that. With that yeah, so. I bet that's what it is. I bet I could find some fungus in there, but I bet the main thing is mm, okay. uh, leaf hopper. And um so is there anything that is there anything I can do at this point or is it just no? Okay. <laughs> okay great. Um, and then one last thing, uh, just rust in kind of a rusty uh, situation in the chart. I, I just am forgetting what that is. Uh, the, the, my second round of chart is just not looking so great. Um, it's kind of spotted and, and rusty. Rusty. I don't know. Is it a maybe it's a fungal leaf spot? I guess I would have to see it. I can take a picture. Yeah. 
Okay, that'd be great. It, you know, as uh, you know, as the season goes on, once it starts cooling off, and we get some of these dews and um, uh, fogs coming in, all the leaf spots and beets and uh, start increasing. So it's a little, it's tough to keep up with it sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Tarnished plant pot can also cause some spotting on leaves and stuff. Oh, okay. I haven't seen much of that down there, but okay. could be. Um, it's just a really, it's a pretty diseasey and pest heavy year this year here. So um, get a lot of good experience, I guess. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're Thanks, welcome. Ryan. There is a question in the chat from Brian about spider mites and cucumbers asking once he pulls the cukes, will the mites persist and affect the next crop? And any tips on what to do in between plantings? Yep. Um, what we have found work, so the way uh, spider mites, uh, their biology is such that uh, when it gets cold, uh, they will uh, change color and they turn sort of a, a darker reddish color and then they move up into the Oh, they either hide under uh, oh, foliage and stuff, uh, or if it's in a high tunnel, they'll go up into the uh, piping and in crevices. And then when it gets warm uh, next spring, they will start coming back again, coming back down again. And so I know of, of some growers that plant green beans, and spider mites love green beans. And when you, uh, if well, tell me, is this outside or inside that you're talking about, Brian? Uh, this is inside in a high tunnel. Okay, so it's perfect. So um, <clears throat> you can, so in the early spring, you plant the green beans before you even plant the cucumbers, and the spider mites will start coming down. They will start emerging from their overwintering sites, and they will find the green beans, and they'll be really happy. And you have two choices. You can... Uh, bag them up uh, and then remove the infested uh, green beans. Uh, or if there aren't too many spider mites on them, you can release natural enemies on them and uh, those natural enemies will continue to reproduce. And then when you, uh, when you plant the cucumbers or whatever in the rest of the uh, high tunnel or whatever, you can, they will move out into the crop um, to protect the crop. And um, so you can either use them as a trap crop and remove them and then keep on planting more beans. The beauty of beans is it's, um, it's so easy to grow them and they grow so quickly that you can, you know, it's not as complicated as some of the other, you don't need a flowering plant or anything so that you can continue to um, plant again and again and to, and to sort of try and lure those uh, spider mites out. And there was one particular grower that uh, is in our area who always lost his crop halfway through, his tomato crop halfway through the season to spider mites. And when he started using the green beans, he's never, he doesn't have to spray anything anymore. Uh, so it works incredibly well. And I think you could do it even if you wanted to uh, if you're going to clean out your crop and start with a fresh one this fall, you could plant beans in there ahead of time and try and uh, get them out that way. So, does that help you with that? That helps very much. Thank you. It, it's so easy. It's so painless. Um, and Margaret, is it any old kind of green bean or are there some well, you know, uh, attributes well, that are better? No, I think it doesn't matter. Just any old, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I, we've never focused on the variety, but like, um, oh, probably lima beans, not that you would use that. They probably wouldn't work very well. Any kind of bush bean, I should say. And you could use, theoretically, you could also use, you know, pole beans, but the beauty of the bush bean is it's so uh, compact. It's easy to remove it if you want to remove it, et cetera, et cetera. But you got to do it early. Um, okay. So there was also a question about Japanese beetles. Do we want to talk about that? Sure. Did you see that in the chat? Because I figured out how to how to look at the chat. Mary Beth, are you still there? 
Mary Beth. I don't, I don't see it. it. Must have been a private chat. Go for it. This will be uh, okay. Recorded. So what she said was sorry, late entering. Uh, so I'm sorry if you've already answered this question. She's a flower grower, Japanese beetles, best time for treating with nematodes and milky spore disease. <clears throat> so my feeling is that milky spore disease, is, there's no point in using that. It's sort of the general recommend or the general school of thought is that it's too cold up here. Are you there? That's her. Okay, I'll just keep going, I guess. So, I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to go. Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. All right. Um, so, so I have never been a fan of milky spore disease. There used to be some real problems with the formulation that it wasn't well produced. It may be better now. It probably is not worth spending your money up here in Vermont because it's the soil is too cold and it will never become established enough. The whole point of milky spore disease is you want it to remain in the soil. And as the Japanese beetle larvae move through the soil, it will come in contact with another infected one, et cetera, et cetera. I have never found it. I have never heard it to be very effective. And so um, I'm assuming that the Japanese beetles you're dealing with are the adults. And you can treat for the larvae until the cows come home. But the Japanese beetles are going to come from your neighbors. So okay. the only way, sadly, for Japanese beetle management to work is to do it on a regional scale. And that will never happen, I, I'd have to say. So, um, so probably treating with pesticides if you have to do it. Um, uh, my experience has been they can be really bad one year and you won't see a single one the next year. And I don't know what it is that does that. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to be particularly weather related as far as I can see. So uh, I'm not helping you very much except maybe saving you money because uh, treating the larvae will have no effect on the adults that emerge. Okay. Don't okay. forget netting, Margaret. <laughs> oh, God. No, netting. Probably in this case, net, if you're growing flowers, netting would probably be good. I, I, I will defer to Vern on that one. I, I, I agree with that. But I just the one issue that I have always had with netting is if you. If you don't put it on soon enough, then the, the pests that have a soil phase will already be under the net and they'll be happy as a clam. They'll be so <laughs> happy and they will thank Vern every day. Oh, dear. So, and, and it reduces the natural enemy population in terms of getting to your to your pest. But there's a time and a place for it, I realize. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Not to beat this into the ground, but for large insects like that, you actually don't need the super fine, expensive netting. People are using things like spotted wing, and you would still allow pretty free flow of most of the smaller insects. Yeah. Yep. I did want to ask you, Margaret, about um, spotted lanternfly, which people I talk to down in Pennsylvania are freaking out about. And is there a monitoring network? And are we... How close is that and how worried should we be? Uh, I think, Anne, you're probably more in touch with all of these oh, pest networks through your yeah. thing is. There's some. Right. I don't, yeah, I don't think we're in danger. I don't think it's uh, very close to us at this point. I will I just add, Anne, um, yeah. I think you're totally right about the, the location. And I think the reason is the, the Climax model, so the models that that look at all of the different um, uh, like climatic factors, I think predict that Vermont is not a hospitable um, right. distribution range. So that's what I've heard. The winter temps might uh, keep us safe from it. Um, so we can only hope. So it's worth maybe mentioning the murder hornet or whatever they call it. Um, I've gotten a few 
uh, calls or emails from people who think that they have um, seen the, the, that hornet that is very aggressive. And in fact, what they're seeing is the great golden digger wasp, which is uh, actually a beneficial, it feeds on grasshoppers and stuff like that. So there is no evidence right now that that hornet uh, is here and it looks very different from the great golden digger wasp or even from other hornets that we have here. It's much bigger and it has a different color, but it's good that people are looking out for it. Who knows how well it'll do in our climate, but, but I guess the one other thing that um, I'm sort of aware of, it seems like there are a lot of, this spring, there were lots of what appeared to be the queen, queen yellow jackets or bald-faced hornets and all those things. And so I suspect there will be a lot of nests around and they will be aggressive. So people need to heed that and get rid of them, I have to say. If they're in, in if they're in a high traveled area, you need to get rid of them because they'll really sting you. And it hurts. Yes. Well, it does come back to identification because someone I know was uh, worried about. Um, I can't remember if it was hornets or wasps near uh, where horses were being ridden, and turns out they were just ground dwelling solitary. Yeah. Uh, insects and they weren't nests and they weren't particularly aggressive. So um, the best way to get you samples, Margaret, is to send them to the plant diagnostic clinic. Well, the fastest is to email me directly, I'd have to say. Then there's sort of no, I mean, you can, with something like some of the hornets, it, it's easy enough to identify them um, with a picture um, or with even looking at the nest or where they are, I guess. One aside is sometimes people will send pictures, say, what is this? And they don't give any context. So you don't know how, um, what, what plant it's on or how it's nesting. Um, uh, for example, someone said, oh, I've got honeybees in my, um, oh, in this uh, lamp post. And it didn't make sense, but I before I sent, a beekeeper out to collect it, I asked them to take a picture. And indeed it was paper, paper wasps and they really needed to get rid of it. So, so pictures can go a long way, but you sort of need to have it within that whole context. Well, great. Thank you both for these presentations and for your great service to all the commercial growers and gardeners, hiding insects and diseases for everybody. And since it's one o'clock, we'll thank everyone for attending and the slides and the recording will soon be posted on the webinar page on the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Grower website. Thanks right. everybody. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Oh.